Well, good morning to all. Glad to have you here in the assembly with us. Very glad to have our brother Joe visiting from Tennessee for our tent meeting. And uh, to be here for the introduction for this class. This is actually a start of a new, a new class that we're doing. Finished Matthew. And now we're moving on into a study of caring enough to correct. We are studying at the same time in our worship assembly about the ways of the wanderers why it is that people obey the truth and then find themselves having a desire to wander back out into the world, thus forsaking God, Jesus, the church, the brethren, the truth, ultimately, at that level. And in studying about how that takes place and how to better understand it, these classes will hopefully tie in well to then help us understand, well, what can we do about it? Here people have wandered off, now what are we supposed to do? Well, in caring enough to correct, it'll give us those pieces of, you know, to go out and do this, you know, go out and perform this action. And ultimately it being this main element that in going about so as to correct these ones that have wandered away from the truth, to be able to come back and, as Jesus said in Matthew 18, if a brother trespasses against you, what do you do? Go to him. All right, go to him and what? It's reconcile. Well. Huh? All right, yeah, you love him, but what are you doing when you're going to him? He's trespassed. 18, 18, 15, and there's a key element. Tell him okay. that you were offended. That's right. You go and tell him his fault. Here's what you've done wrong. Well, you're just here to rub my nose in it. No, I'm here because I care about you. And that is an element of the care. I've got to tell you what the wrong is. Well, I don't like how that makes me feel. I'm not worried about that. That's what Jesus says that you do if you are involved in this element of actually caring. So with this study, we're trying to flip the script on how people think about correction. Correction, church discipline, has been misused so many times. And we're going to deal with some of those elements of how it is that this uh, teaching of the Bible ends up being used incorrectly. And because of that, people no longer see correction discipline as this right here as a caring element. Now part of what this stems from is even before people find themselves in the church. People are introduced to correction. Where? Repentance? No. At home. At home. So what happens if you're not correcting the right way at home? That finds its way into the church. All of this finds itself starting before we even get to what we're doing here. So what we're teaching, what we're presenting, is not only applicable for what we have here with church members, for parents with young children, you need to learn how to correct at home because how you end up disciplined at home is how they are going to grow up being used to discipline and in turn disciplining and if you're not doing it right at home it's not going to happen right in the church so all of this is key to making sure that we're actually helping 
bring about uh, you know proper growth and maturity not just not just here but these things will will in fact follow us home so with that in view we've had these discussions uh, in our first Corinthians class and even in Matthew as we were going through 18 and uh, the different sections about you know church discipline and how it's supposed to be done and how it is that church discipline is on the decline just more and more you're finding congregations that are not going to be involved in doing this well I just don't think it will work well that right there shows a lack of trust in what God has said God says to do this but you're saying it won't work then the question has to arise well have you even tried majority of the time the answer is no well then how do you know it won't work but just as we've said if you're not doing it correctly then yeah it's not going to work but we're going to look at this from the aspect of both sides from those who are doing the correcting and the ones who are being corrected both parties play a role in this now part of this decline is because of a loss of what discipline is and how it is supposed to be used it's a caring thing it's a loving thing and we're going to establish that with our study one reason that discipline is not more widely practiced is because in the past it's been abused that in fact the wrong person ends up being disciplined and we're going to elaborate on that more as we move forward you have those that have a fearful reaction fearful of the reaction of false teachers well we can't correct because this person's going to get mad let them get mad that's more reason to correct if that's going to be their attitude you don't need that so the false teachers who would promote false doctrine we just don't want to step into it and then disrupting those that are going to ultimately end up following what they're going to do thus leaders allow error to go unchallenged and when you have that kind of thing going on in a congregation where error is just allowed to go on without it being challenged this is what you have oftentimes it's because of a they're deceived by a perverted view of love well, love just tolerates. Love is, you know, we're, we're being compassionate, so on and so forth. No, that's not what love does. Love corrects. Then leaders of the church are too often, they tolerate immorality. And what that produces, the results of that, is you have a congregation that is confused about doctrine, what they're supposed to uphold, what they're supposed to believe, and they end up compromising on their morals. Because there's not enough correction. Not enough, it's just, it's holding the line. Here's what the truth says. Here's somebody that's gone against it. Okay, we're going to do something about it. And if you don't, that spreads. Well, if he gets to have this idea and this belief, this way of thinking, why can't I have my way of thinking and it further splinters the unity that's supposed to be there do you have, have something okay so yeah any anytime anybody has a thought just raise your hand and I'll stop yeah I was going to give you an incident that happened many years ago to me uh, I was a deacon and had a good friend that was a deacon in a congregation we attended he left his wife for another woman mm. I went to him on three occasions talking to him. First time he enjoyed my visit. Second time not so much. Third time he didn't want me there. Yeah. I seen that I wasn't getting anywhere with him. He wasn't going to listen. He was going to do what he wanted to. So I went to the eldership and I said it's time to do something because he's not coming back. He's already made that clear. Well we're not going to do anything because he's still got family sitting out here. Mm. We're afraid we'll offend him. Right. That was the answer I got. And I said, well, you're going to offend somebody you already have by not doing anything. That's right. And so that goes back into the wrong person being disciplined. They're worried about him and then his family, who's the one person that they are forgetting in all of this that they really should be showing compassion and understanding to. Just go ahead and say it. God. Well, God, but... You said it's a husband, right? Yeah. yeah. Who are they ignoring? The 
wife. The wife. The innocent party. Well, let's do what we can to protect the guilty person and leave the innocent one out here to just crash and burn. That's ridiculous. And that's what ends up hurting people to where they want to walk away from the church. They're not receiving justice. But that's what happens. So yeah, as we're going through these studies, we're going to be, I have personal accounts like that. I appreciate that one. This stuff is going on all over the place. It's happening all over because people are scared to death to act. Well, what will it do? Will it cause a split? Possibly. But you don't know that. Could actually end up binding people closer together. Have them, instead of have them, you know, focusing in on this hard-headed husband who doesn't want to do anything, why not circle the rag wagons around the wife and cause that to draw you closer together in tending to her, taking care of her, and helping her? Because she certainly is the one needing it at this point because the husband is showing he's not wanting the help. Go to the one who needs the help and will actually take the help. So that's a good, that's a good point. Well, this was a very poor eldership to begin with. Right. One of them told me, he said, if I find out for a fact that he's done this, then I will, that'll be the first thing we do. Yeah. I know for a fact he went to her and she confirmed that, yes, he has left me. Wow. But nothing was then ever nothing said happened. or done. Yeah. So that's a lot of talk with no action. Exactly. And that's well, what? These men that were there as elders were unqualified to begin with. Yeah. And I have some illustrations like that too. So, and all that does is just okay. We're that ends up putting us in a position where we're no better than than the denominations. Yeah. We claim to believe in the book, the Bible. Okay, and we claim to follow the Bible. All right, here's what the Bible says about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and then just poof, don't do it. Might as well go out here and do do something else. Let's just go fishing. So if we're wanting to be something different, this is one of the elements that's truly going to make us different. We care about the truth. We care about the doctrine and we care enough to correct when somebody crosses it, so when somebody transgresses against it. So this study will lay out for us the biblical base and the biblical extent of fellowship at the same time. Who can we have fellowship with? Who can we not have fellowship with? Who does it need to be withdrawn from? So on and so forth. So, and it really is only an understanding, a proper understanding of fellowship that can one then truly understand and appreciate the power of discipline. Because the key element in this, if the brother won't hear you and won't repent, well then you withdraw fellowship from him. But what if you didn't have any fellowship to begin with? You've not lost anything. He's not lost anything. So that very element that's supposed to help draw him back was never there in the first place. So even as we're considering the idea of correction, the element of fellowship has to be there first. There has to be that connection and closeness. We're supposed to be brothers and sisters. But how, much, like how many congregations actually have that kind of relationship? That's the thing. Fellowship's not taught. Yeah. So if fellowship's not taught, then discipline's out the window. That's right. We definitely ain't going to deal with that. That's right. Nobody, you're not going to do it correctly, and the ones that are being disciplined, they're not going to understand it. So there's, there's many facets to this, and we'll, we'll try to make sure we hit on them as we, as we go through. And, and with that, in showing a proper usage of correction, we will then be showing that discipline is not a political club or weapon to beat people back with. Most of the time that's how it's used. It's not as a tool of correction because we care, it's because I'm mad at you. Discipline is not to be a reactionary thing to frustrations but it's supposed to be a positive element in the, uh, in the life of the church. So as we're thinking about just from that standpoint, move it, you know, move it from the church element, the church idea of discipline, and it just being used as you know, a reaction to frustration, I'm angry, I'm mad. You can see that happen all the time. Just go to Walmart with a mom that's there with her kids. 
and how she's reacting to the bad behavior of the children and she's just yelling at them. That's not correction. That's not discipline. That's just you being frustrated and lashing out. That's not how you correct. That's not how you discipline. And what helps with that is you don't let people do things that frustrate you. So at the same time that I'm reading my biblical information, I'm also listening to a lot of Jordan Peterson. Now granted, he's not a Christian, but when it comes to dealing with children and different things like that, he does have a lot of biblical connection in his presentations. And one of the things that he mentions about raising children that you can actually grow up to like is you do not let them do things that frustrate you. Because all you're doing is, well, okay, yeah, I don't like this, but I'm not doing anything about it. They keep doing it. I don't like it. They keep doing it. I don't like it. They keep doing it. I don't like it. And eventually what happens? You accept it. Do what? You accept it. You either accept it and it's just, well, just not going to do anything about it, or you blow your top. Yeah. And you lash out in anger. That doesn't help the child's development. Mm -hmm. Doesn't help the child's growth and doesn't help one's growth in the church either. <coughs> Now, with that introduction, moving in to our first point, we want to get into the who of discipline. Jordan gets it. But when we're considering the who, we want to study first who not to discipline. Before we get into who actually needs it, we want to talk about who doesn't. And that discipline we're going to establish that discipline is a practical expression of love in the family. After establishing that, then we want to study who does in fact need to be disciplined. Now, when we're thinking about reasons why discipline is not practiced more often, here's a prime point. It's still connected to the who and who doesn't need it. Inconsistency in discipline leads to a large section of failure the few times that it is implemented. It's not more widely practiced because in the past it's been abused and that the wrong ones have been disciplined leading to this inconsistency. One way that church discipline fails is in what we have pictured here on the left side of the screen. Or my right. Your, is that your left? Yeah, that's your left. With this target. Now, you see with this target, the shots are all over the place. Now, we've got some shooters here in the room. Is that the kind of shooting that you want taking place? No. What are you wanting? On target, smaller grouping. Okay, you want a group. You may not be able to hit bullseye, but as long as you've got a group that's in here, your shooting is consistent. And that's somebody that has learned their skill. But when it comes to church discipline, it, a lot of times it's like this. It is scattered all over the place. It's off target. It's not where it's needing to go. Now, you just think about this. Would you want an officer, like a police officer, coming to your rescue that shoots like this? No. no. How about a doctor <laughs> who's, you know, can't figure out where they're needing to go and their hand's shaky with the blade? You want that person operating on you? No. Or trying to draw blood. Yeah, try, yeah, trying to draw blood, anything like that. But this, these are the kind of people that we end up sending out to do church discipline. And then we wonder why it doesn't work. You're not skilled. You're not learned. There's no, you know, no actual discipline in your efforts of discipline. So church discipline that is used inconsistently and administered with partiality 
instead of following the biblical guidelines, leads to stuff like this. Leaders will then respond to peer pressure if it would in fact please the people. And we have some scriptures that are like that. So when we're, so when we're thinking about these things, this is the imagery that we should be thinking when we're involved in church discipline. Hebrews 4.12, we're told that the Word of God is quick, powerful, and what? Sharper than a two-edged sword. Sharper than a two-edged sword. How careful do you think we need to be? Very careful. So sharp that it's piercing even to the divine and sunder soul and spirit. The joints and the marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is what we're doing when we're involved in correcting people in the church. There's sin in their life, and many times how is sin described, pictured? I'm thinking specifically of Hymenaeus and Philetus. The, well, you leave them shipwrecked, but what is their teaching described as? Their word? All right, a canker, gangrene, a cancer. So we've got to go in there and cut that out. That takes skill. And if you don't have the skill to do it, you can go in there and start slicing away, doing more damage than you can actually help. So this is what we're doing, a brother or sister that is sick in sin, and we're trying to perform surgery to cut that stuff out. Not just put a band-aid on it. Not just trying to cover it. You have got to remove it. So how serious does this need to be? Does this need to be taken? This is life or death. As pictured on the screen, what about what we're dealing with sin? That's spiritual life and death that we're dealing with. Another way that this can be viewed is like church discipline is literally a tribunal. So you are in fact in a position to where you are having to, like this person here, who's on trial, and you're having to trust your lawyer to present a defense and the evidence truthfully and effectively. So that the judge will hear that evidence, and in some of these cases, the decision is life or death. So how serious is this? When we're thinking about investigating, hearing out a person's cause, so on and so forth, all of that's in play when we're thinking about church discipline. People take this stuff very seriously. When I was on trial with the Baptist Church taking me to court, this was serious. And that I'm trusting in my lawyer, hey, you better represent me correctly in this thing because I can be in some big trouble. That's what we're dealing with. That's what we're playing with. And if you don't look at it from that aspect, then you'll just, what's the big deal? Who really cares? No, there's a lot riding on this when we're thinking about this subject. So, when we're thinking about partiality and inconsistency with discipline and correction, you can see it played out in the positive side or on the pleasing side here in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. We see this activity with Herod, but this kind of stuff goes on in the church too. Here's this person, not really done anything wrong, but in knowing that there's a gripe, between this person and this group, the leadership then says, well, okay, we can see that it'll make this group happy and we're just going to take action on this guy. That's inconsistency. And that's not how this is supposed to be done. You are causing a soul to be shipwrecked in that. So this will make the group happy. Let's discipline. Then there's the other side. Matthew 27, 24, here's Pilate. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, 
He took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. So if disciplining a person, or in this case, not disciplining a person, should bring an unfavorable result, what's going to make this group angry? And then they decide to act based upon the emotions of this other group, that's inconsistency. That's partiality. That's a respect to persons. That is not supposed to be had when we are involved in disciplining. So here we have leadership that will try to hide their head in the sand so as to not upset a certain class. As Brother Joe said, well, we don't want to offend this group. It will make them angry so we won't do anything. That's what causes discipline to fail. Because just like with children, children know when mom and dad are not disciplining the same way. They recognize it. Now, oftentimes we start, you know, we will turn later on in years, we'll start turning that into a joke. Well, I can remember always getting spanked and, you know, baby brother always got away with everything. Ha ha ha. Okay, we joke about it now, but going through it, that's not how it should have been. There's truth in that. And what that ends up doing is creates a cycle that people grow up with. We are trying to create an even board that, no, it doesn't matter who it is. Discipline is going to be given out the same. So most of the time, most of the time, it's not even, yeah, it's this section here. We don't want to make anybody mad on how leadership decides who they're going to discipline and who they're not. When this kind of stuff ends up happening, instead of being shepherds of the sheep, leadership ends up being like this. Feathers that are just blown in the wind. You never know what they're going to do. Never know where they're going to come down, what decision they're going to make. And here's an illustration. I don't know that this is real, but it's very fitting to how a lot of people end up dealing with discipline in the home and discipline in the church. And we're still on the point of who not to discipline. So there's a story about a spoiled little boy and he ends up getting to the age where he ends up starting school. And the parents were not disciplinaries. They were very permissive and allowed the child to grow up without discipline. So that allowed the child to get used to always getting his way. The parents had a meeting with the teacher before the child started school and told the teacher that the child was a very sensitive child. Now I'm using these terms because they have connection even though we're talking about children playing into adulthood. He's a sensitive child and unaccustomed to discipline. And they would then suggest a way for the teacher to then get the child to obey. If the child did something wrong, the parents suggested, to another child, the teacher should go to, their, to the child's desk, tell the child what they did wrong, but then administer discipline to the other child. And the parents believed that this would then teach the child, their child, to be afraid of not doing wrong again. But there's so many problems in that. Because in doing that, as we mentioned with the husband and the wife, there's so much focus on this individual who's being left out of the equation. The other child. The other child. What is that kind of action going to end up doing to that child? They've done nothing wrong but yet they're the ones receiving the punishment. They're the ones receiving the grief, the hostility. 
Well, that child could end up resenting the teacher. No. End up hating school. Leave school. Stop trying to be good all, you know, all together. There ends up being placed so much focus over here that the focus is actually being put on the wrong person. We are supposed to protect the innocent. We do not protect the guilty. The guilty are guilty. They need to be called out. They need to be corrected. And thus, for the sake of the innocent. But many times, when it comes to church discipline, this is how it ends up going. Here is somebody who is clearly misbehaving and acting up. And then instead of correcting them, we want to try to correct this other person. And a lot of times we end up projecting what this person is doing onto the others. Well, you're being this way. You're doing this. You're doing that. No, I'm not. And the one that actually is doing those things, you're not doing anything about that's inconsistency, and that's not the proper way to discipline. Yeah. I'm reminded of Ezekiel 18:20, "The soul that sinneth, it shall right. die." Right. Not the innocent party. Yeah. Punishment's being dealt to the one that's in sin. Did you have something? No. Okay. You need to stop moving your hands. <laughs> think, think of this as an auction. Yeah. <laughs> if that hand goes up, buddy, you're on a bid. I'll come up with something. <laughs> but that's right. God looks at the ones that are involved in committing the sin. But we start getting into this field where it's, well, we don't, we don't want to jump on this person because we don't want to run, it, run them away, so we end up jumping on somebody else. Well, what about pushing them away? Here they are trying to do what they can to be good, and you're wanting to punish them. So to tack on to that, as Joe mentioned, Ezekiel 18, let's look at 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5, 20 and 21. Them that sin, rebuke before all. Now, which, by the way, for you two that are developing sermons, here's another example of how to block off sections to build your points directly from the text. Here's your point number one, point number two, three, four, so on and so forth. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by par partiality. Now, notice this text contrasted to the illustration we just dealt with. Oh, our child is sensitive you can't handle him like you would everybody else. If he does wrong, you correct somebody else. Here's what God says about it. Them that sin. Notice, it's not anybody else. The ones that are receiving the discipline are the ones that sin. They're to be corrected. Them that sin... That phrase is one word in the Greek. It's the same word for trespass in Matthew 18. So we're in the exact same context. Those that sin, those that trespass. And it's also used in Romans chapter 6 of those that continue in sin. To transgress or trespass is to miss the mark and not get the prize. Sin that is continued in is not to be excused or tolerated. In doing that and tolerating it, you allow the innocent to suffer because of their continued bad behavior. 
Now notice the rest of the verse. Those that sin, rebuke. Now rebuke and reproof are similar. They're very close in their connection, but rebuke is stronger. So you don't go and rebuke these people that are over here on the sidelines that didn't do anything. The one that's in the wrong, you lay that at their feet. Now also notice how it's being done. Them that sin rebuke before all. A thing that is public, a sin that is committed public, needs to be corrected publicly. And there's even a reason for that. Just like with little children at home, big brother does something wrong, he gets spanked for what he does, what's that supposed to do? That others also may fear. The younger kids are supposed to learn from the mistakes of the big guys. Okay, here's what he did and he got in trouble. I don't want that. The same thing is happening in the church. You misbehave, you're not acting correctly, and you won't take the initial corrections, then here's what you get. You get rebuke, you get it before all, that others also may fear. Everybody learns from this. And then we see how serious this is, that this be done. This isn't an option. This is a command. What you got? I think Matthew 18, verses 15 uh, through 20 gives the procedure and the steps in going that far. Yeah, and definitely for private matters. Yeah. So definitely when it comes into play with private matters, there are extra steps to this. You go to them privately, you take two or three witnesses, and then you take it before all. But something that's just done out in the open, there's, yeah. there's no reason to go privately. Everybody knows about it. <coughs> now here's the seriousness of this, of this uh, situation. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. How many does it take to be public contrary to a private? What does that mean? So private's normally one-on-one, -on -one, right? Right. How many does it take for a public... Well, it depends on the situation. Okay. So you might have a situation where a thing is going on between one brother and a brother, but then if this brother ends up bringing other brethren into it by either making accusations against them or what have you, now you've got to bring these other people into it because accusations have been made against them. Okay. So the matter is able to stay as private as the one that's in sin wants to keep it private. But if the one that is in sin trespasses against a brother, starts making all kinds of accusations and ends up bringing accusations against the church, then you've got no other choice but to bring the church into it. But then you have other situations where, like we could be, like we could be having a get together or sharing in a meal together or even you know something in, in an assembly take place, and that's no longer private. Like, that's public. Yeah. Make, yeah, that okay. makes sense. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So here's the charge, the command being given to do this, that thou observe, and here's, so here's the qualification that we're discussing even in the text, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Correction is to be without bias. It does not matter how influential that member may be. If they are in sin, you correct them. It does not matter how much pressure might be put on you by the family or even by friends. If that person is sin, in sin, you correct it. It does not matter how many threats are made to start more trouble. I mean, that right there is further evidence that that person needs to be corrected. If that's your mentality, 
well, I'm, I'm not going to make this better. I'm just going to make this worse. You're showing your bad attitude. Correction must be made. When partiality and bias, well, this person is a big giver. We can't lose that money that's coming in every week. When that kind of stuff starts happening in discipline, discipline loses its positive power. It's now no longer a tool of correct, like a loving tool of correction. This is just a weapon that you're using to abuse people. But this is a difficult thing to get past and to get over. You read about the Pharisees and how they were not willing to make proper judgment and proper decisions on things because they didn't want to lose their position. They didn't want to lose what they had. Same thing with Pilate. A tumult rises up. They Rome brings somebody else in, in charge and they replace me. The overall theme, though, has to continue to be in love. Yeah. It has to be shown in love and care for that person's soul to correct them. Yeah. If not, if the person senses some hostility or anything, this can come down to drawing sides. Yeah, that's right. And then they will start rallying people around them, look what they did to me. Yep. And, and you that's, have to be careful of that. And that's a good point to bring up when you're dealing with the private matter situation. Yeah. That's what going to them privately is designed not to do. Because once you start trying to pull people onto your side, giving your persuasion or your view of how a thing happened, you're poisoning the well. So to do this privately is to keep all of that party issue from coming up. And even then, it's designed to give that person the ability to repent without anybody being the wiser. So God is fully aware of how things can go. Okay, here's a trespass, and it's not just something flippant, as we said in our Matthew study. This is something serious. Trespass to sin, to miss the mark. This isn't just some casual offense. You have seriously done something wrong. I'm going to come to you privately, one-on-one, -on -one, so that you and I can fix it, and nobody else even has to know. You don't have to go through that shame and that embarrassment. But if that brother refuses that, now we're bringing two or three witnesses. So what you could have escaped, you've brought on yourself. And then if you don't listen to two or three witnesses, now that embarrassment's getting even larger because now it's got to go before the church. Didn't have to go that way. Could have been avoided. But even with that, that embarrassment, shame is not needing to happen if the one being disciplined is recognizing what's taking place. And that's the element that gets left out in this. We want to focus on the ones doing the discipline. Okay, you've got to follow these rules. Yeah, that's right. But are there rules for the one being disciplined? Yes, there are. And if that person is not following the rules on how to be disciplined, then it's not going to go well. If he does not view this as what we're establishing as, okay, these people are coming to me because they care about me. If they're not going to see it that way, if they're going to build up some partiality in their mind of why this is happening, this is going south. But you can't put that on the person who's doing the correcting. That's on the one that's being corrected. All right, so that's number one about who's not needing to be disciplined. That inconsistency that's taking place. Instead of actually correcting the one that needs it, you correct these others. They're just bystanders. So that's one way that it's misused. Here's point number two on how discipline is misused. The silencer. 
sometimes discipline will be used as a means to silence a messenger who threatens to expose sin and error. Almost every preacher, myself included, has experienced this in one way or another. You preach against some sin or some error that's going on in the congregation and then the leadership decides to correct you so as to silence you. And they try to cut you off from fellowship of those who would allow sin to continue. Sandpoint. Sandpoint. While I was in preaching school, I was receiving funds from a congregation actually in Munford. And with the students that they supported, they wanted them to come in every few Sundays or whatever and you know, give a presentation, give a sermon just to see how progress was being done. The first sermon that I presented there was actually something that I was developing for my class on the Song of Solomon. And I made connection from the Song of Solomon and the discussion that's being had there between husband and a wife and the emotions that are there for Jesus and his church, which, of course, the New Testament describes very well. Ephesians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, so on and so forth. If I had to go back and give a percentage of how much my sermon was on the topic of love and admiration and affection, I don't feel bad in saying that it was about 90, 95%. That that was the idea throughout the sermon. But I got to my conclusion after discussing all of that element, all that discussion about loving God, loving Christ, loving His church, and I used one verse, John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I said, if that's the positive of that verse, what's the negative? Now, of course, it's a sermon, so nobody answered and I answered it. If you do not keep his commandments, you do not love Jesus. And then I just went ahead and said it. There are a lot of people in denominations that are not keeping the commandments of God and that according to this verse, you do not love God. Most of the time, I don't notice when there's moving or shuffling around, but I noticed this time that a lady in the back got up and left. Well, didn't think anything of it until about a few months later and they had me come back for another sermon. But 10 minutes before I was set to speak, the elders pulled me into a meeting. And they told me that that lady that got up and left was a visitor and she was mad because of what I said at the end. And those elders started trying to put pressure on me to alter and to silence what I had said. But that's not what you said. That's but it's, what Jesus said. Exactly. And they were telling me all this stuff. She has, she's been coming for two years and all this kind of stuff. And that, you know, that was the thing that made her mad. And I just asked the elders, I said, well, is that the first time in all those two years that she's heard that verse? She heard it from me the first time in two years? They didn't like that too much. And so then they started saying at that point, as, you, know, you know, we don't want that kind of stuff, you know, so on and so forth. Or we're going to end up dropping your support while you're in school. Well, I left the meeting, and luckily, I kept, you know, kept some extra sermons in my Bible, and I have one that is centered around biblical evangelism. I got up in that sermon, laid out my evidences for what I did from Scripture, 
And then I called the elders out. I told the congregations, your elders just had a meeting with me to try to silence me. Needless to say, they stopped supporting me while I was in school. And even after that, the preacher that was there, he then felt the need to talk to me further in the parking lot. And he was just, Mike, you, you, know, you just don't do that kind of stuff. You don't go against the eldership. You don't blah, 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 this, that, and the other. Now, there's one phrase that he said that stands out with me because it just, like, it, it just really struck me that he would say it. But he told me, he said, Micah, you don't bite the hand that feeds. And I looked at him, I told him, I said, brother, you don't feed me. So and in other words, you tolerate sin? Exactly. You just tolerate. You don't say what the Bible actually says. You tiptoe around it. You allude to it but you don't just come out and say it. And that was an eldership that tried to silence me because one person got mad. And my response to the preacher was, well, did you chase after her? Why didn't you go get her and bring her back and let's talk to her? Well, no, 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 we can't do that. That, that just make her mad. Well, what about what you're doing to me right now? You see, we don't align things properly. That kind of stuff goes on all the time. But it doesn't just happen to preachers, it also happens to membership. The Ronan group over here, they bring in children's church, you guys study it out, and it's like, hey, we don't have scriptural authority for this. And you try to bring it before them, have men's meetings about it, what do they do? Silence you. We're just not going to talk about it. It's not how this operates. But this is what people will do under the illusion that this is church discipline. That's not church discipline. Sometimes in this situation, it's only a few that are involved in this kind of practice. Other times it's a distinct party that's in the congregation, which that kind of stuff's not supposed to be going on anyways. Clicks, party mentality. Other times it ends up being the whole congregation that sides against that one person who is trying to do what's right. And why is that? Well, it's easier to deal with this one than to have to deal with the one, two, three, four that might be involved in this sin. And especially if this person's already an outsider. Usually with preachers that are in congregations, they're not from that congregation. They're an outside hire that comes in and then, well, you're just here stirring up trouble. And you know, you're not really one of us anyway, so it's easy to get rid of you than it is to deal with the person who's actually entrenched in the congregation. There's a lot of moving facets to this. There's a lot of mentality, a lot of uh, attitudes and emotions that go along with this that we've got to be aware of and be able to spot when this stuff ends up happening. So withdrawal of fellowship is merely the silent isolation of a few. It's a subtle threat from those that are in power. And it ends up leading to outright expulsion by the party that controls the church. Now, this is no new thing. All throughout the Old Testament, you can read about God's prophets like Elijah, Amos, Jeremiah, who were rejected by the people in control. And they were rejected because their sermons, their message exposed sin and error. Well, we're not going to listen to you, Jeremiah. We're going to throw you in a pit. We're going to put you in jail. Amos, you're from the southern kingdom. What are you doing up here in the northern kingdom? You go back home if you're wanting to, to prophesy. That same stuff goes on. 
John the Baptist was beheaded because he exposed the adultery of Herod. When church discipline is used to rid the church of those who would oppose her sins, total apostasy is the only destination left. Nobody wants to go that route. Nobody wants to be apostate. Nobody wants to fall off into heresy. Then you have got to start correcting things. Otherwise, we're just going to be like the denominations when we accept everything and anything. I think there's a great misunderstanding in the church as to why discipline's administered in the first place. Yep. The first and foremost thing is to save that soul. Yep. James 5, 19 and 20 tells us that. It's also to keep the church pure. But that soul is endangering itself and we need to bring it back with the brotherly love that yep. we should show. But with those things that you said, there's a soul that's lost. Okay, we got to point that out. Do you think the person that's in that sin is going to like that? Hey, brother, we're here because you're lost. No, I'm not. That depends on their attitude. It depends on them. How they accept it. That's right. And then I forget the next, the next part that you said, but it, it's, the same, you know, it's the same type of thing. Uh, oh, to keep the church pure. Yeah. Well, that implies there's some type of impurity that we've got to call out. Well, no, 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 we can't do that. If we're going to correct, we can't call it out. You're not going to achieve anything if you don't actually call it out. It's like going to the doctor, which I think we're all on the same page with this. Going to the doctor with some type of ailment, the doctor won't tell you what the ailment is. Well, I know what it is, but I'm not going to tell you. Well, what good are you? And that's the game that a lot of brethren play. Well, I know what's wrong, but we're just going to tiptoe around it, skirt around it, all these different kind of things, and not actually get down in it. Because, as Brother Joe said, they view that as not being loving. So, Paul had this very thing in mind when he wrote this to the Galatian brethren. He's writing this letter to the church at Galatia because they are wanting to depart from the truth. And he's having to call them out for it. And he does so in some very direct and plain terms. Oh, foolish Galatians! So when Paul is writing this section, he knows exactly what's going on. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Which is, you're being deceived by false teachers. You have taken in false doctrine. You are leaving the gospel of Christ. I'm telling you all of this because it's the truth. But how will brethren react? Yeah. You're now my enemy. Yeah. That's not what we're doing here. That's not how this is needing to go down. Too often those who tell us truths we need to hear are the ones that we end up cutting off from our fellowship. Well, I'm now mad at you because I don't like what you said. Well, is it right? Yeah, it's right, but I don't like it. I don't care. Is it right? Well, yeah, it's right. Then you need to change. This ends up being done by cold silence, isolation of social withdrawal, forming an opposition party, you know, gathering troops onto your side, expulsion by withdrawing fellowship, or going so far as to fire the preacher. We cannot use church discipline and an improper means or by ulterior ways or alternative ways and hope to bring about godly repentance. It's just not possible. And what these studies are designed to do is designed to get us all on the same page. 
not just to view it, not just to study it from the standpoint of, okay, here's how we're supposed to be when we correct. But as every single one of us is sitting here today, putting us in the realization, okay, I may find myself being the one to be corrected. I need to keep all of this in my mind. That when it's my turn to be corrected, why is this happening? Okay, obviously these brethren are coming to me because they, they let's put it that way, they think I did something wrong. Okay, let me hear them out. Because it very well could be that I have done something wrong. And they're coming to me to tell me what is wrong, not because they're mad or they're frustrated or anything like that. They are here to help. Okay, let me hear you out. And if there's something there, then let me admit it. Let me fess up to it. Okay, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I did that. I'm sorry. Shouldn't have done it. That's the end of it. And it very well could be the case that brethren come with something and it's a misunderstanding. So in that case, guess what I don't need to do? If it's a misunderstanding, I don't need to blow this thing out of proportion and make something out of it when nothing's there. Because now I've just made it worse. Everybody's in play here. And we understand, yeah, emotions run high. Frustration does come in. People want to get defensive. But when I start feeling that, I need to acknowledge it, that I'm doing it, and set it to the side. Just stop. Take a breath. It's like, hey, hold on a second. I'm not needing to move, you know, move into this arena. So when we're thinking about if a message makes us uncomfortable and threatens the status quo, well, here's how we're used to doing things. We should consider the possibility that we may need to repent and we may need to change about how we think about some stuff. Rather than simply trying to remove the messenger. So, that's looking at some of the who's that are not needing to be disciplined. The inconsistence, the attempts to silence. And next week, we'll move into what discipline is all about. And how that discipline as a family matter. You guys get this image? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just making sure. I'm showing. Well, it's not a thing of. Did I do that? Okay. I was. I didn't see any reaction, so I felt like I was showing my age. Well, you <laughs> just. You kept flipping through it. It was like, oh, that's funny, but we're not supposed to see it because you accidentally right. flipped to it. Okay. So yeah, next week we'll get into this information in view of as brother joe is mentioning this is all about caring so a family that cares is going to bring about correction we'll deal with that next next week any uh further thoughts questions on what we uh what we went through this morning all right no hands i appreciate everybody's attention and the uh discussion that we did have what do we get to hear that evangelism sermon that you did? <laughs> Maybe. Okay. And, and tell me that I'm not supposed to do what I'm, <laughs> what I'm doing, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll pull it out. All right. Do not preach the Lord God. Yeah. <laughs>